Thank you. And welcome to Cinema 4D in a broadcast environment. Make your life easier with Cinema 4D's versatility. Um, just a little bit about myself. My name is Dan Pierce. I am the uh, one of the motion graphics design directors at the Broadcast Design Group, which is an internal design group at the Fox Broadcast Company. Um, I have a full presentation here, so I'm not going to waste any time uh, going through any of my stuff. Uh, if you do want to check it out further, you can go to theautomator.tv. Um, I don't really do reels, but I do breakdowns and I do uh, development and stuff like that. So if you go there, you'll be able to see a lot of the uh, things that I've done. Um, just a little bit of what we do at the Broadcast Design Group. Uh, we design identity for on-air promo. So as you can see from these, we have to be capable of doing a lot of different styles and um, putting it together. So um, we do stuff for on-air, so that's what you see on TV. And uh, recently, we've been doing a lot of non-traditional format marketing. And uh, as you can see, we start doing some larger screens up in the uh, top right there. That's called the Godzilla screen. That's in Times Square. Uh, one, of, if not the biggest uh, continuous screen in North America. And um, we did uh, some great work with the uh, 24 Legacy up there. And down the bottom, this is something I did for the Orville. And uh, that's actually a third, maybe a quarter of the actual horizontal width of that full screen. If I put it in an HD screen, it would be super tiny. So I just crop that off. I think the uh, total pixel width was 23,000 pixels. So it was a big deal uh, to render that through. But we used Cinema 4D for all of these, and it was not a problem at all. So just to move on, uh, if you're watching this, you're probably interested in motion graphics and part of a community. So this is uh, kind of the collective what we do. We're lucky enough to create and collaborate with people. Our industry has an amazing supportive community with events like this, and people put up tutorials. And I think that adds real value uh, to all of our work. So being creative is one part of this, but the other part is to be a problem solver. You uh, have to figure out and articulate um, people's ideas. Sometimes they're not creative. And you got to figure out what they actually want, what the tone is, and then furthermore, how to actually physically make that. So to remain creative, as well as being a problem solver, a major thing for that is versatility. So versatility in how you approach a project, how you create workflows. Uh, after you do it a few times, you realize where the snags are, and you uh, set up um, uh, ways to get around that or know what's going to come up. So versatility in your tool set is something uh, major as well. And that's where Cinema 4D comes in. Thank you, Matthias. All right, so here is an example of one of uh, uh, the things that we've done. This was called Fox Presents. And this went on the um, right before the broadcast of our um, Fox produced show. So as you can see in the very beginning, we have a Fox station ID. And uh, we have a secondary animation of presents. And then we go into um, the screen, which we have imagery of the show, as well as the logo. Now, granted, Fox has a lot of different shows. So going into this, we knew we had to switch all these things out. So we built it in such a way that we could uh, switch out the logo. We could switch out the imagery without having to uh, redesign everything. And if you notice in the front part, it's going to let me scrub there. So we did this in a way, too. This was actually all just black and white. And then in the comp, in After Effects, we could change it. Um, we used UV maps to write on this sort of light box look. And uh, that worked out really well. And we've used that a couple times. So just to show an example of how we had to do this, my esteemed colleague, uh, David Miramontes, did a wonderful job of going through these. This is probably a half or a third of all the different ones that he had to do. And you can see that we have a dark one, a light one. And we could switch all these things out as they came up. So. Um, for this presentation, I decided to uh, just build a custom project so I can highlight a few more features than what we used in the Fox Presents. So let's just imagine we, uh, we have a fictional network here called Flux. And one of their uh, things that they want to do, they want to create a modular template that can be skinned in different ways. And so we're going to use the versatility of Cinema 4D to uh, achieve those results quickly. And that's very important because, sadly, we don't want to say it, but time is money. We want to get through these things as quick as possible and as efficiently as possible. And how to break down this project to ease the production repetition and tricks on how to make the versioning easier because that's where you really get tied up in a lot of time. 
So the creative brief would be in the very beginning. You want your tune-in messaging really clear. And um, we're going to do four different genres. We do action, comedy, sci-fi, and thriller. And we can see how the tool set of Cinema 4D has all the uh, options available to see those through. And then, of course, build procedurally when you can, because remember, there will be changes. Oh, yes, there will be changes. So. Here's just an example. Um, on the left, we have a base project here. And a lot of times, you get assets from people that, um, uh, or you didn't actually work on it. You get assets from other people, perhaps even a vendor. And um, you're going to have to sort through those files and figure out how to break it apart to make your life easier. On the right, you just have an example of how these things are going to end up. So we're going to go in. We're going to assess the scene and figure out how to optimize it for production. So let's just uh, jump into that. So here's our base scene that we got. Let's just say we got it from a vendor, and we got to go in and we change it. So here's our tune-in info, um, info here. We're going to change that later. That's going to be switched out many times to tomorrow, tonight, next week, all that kind of thing. Um, we're going to have a nice reflection on the ground, so we're going to have to figure out how to extract that from the actual scene. And then we go through this li little corridor, and then we end up in, let's just call this the resolve. So we can't change the architecture of this, but we can add to it so um, as you saw on the previous slide, as it's going through, everything's all in the same place. It's just toned in a different way. So if I just uh, switch cameras really quickly here, you can see how it's broken up, and it makes a lot more sense. OK, this is going to be one set. This is going to be another set, and this will be another. So we don't have to render this entire thing all at once, and then we can pick and choose uh, once the changes come through. OK, so that's a little bit about the base project. So. On Monday, I did part one of this, and we went over the action and the comedy scene um, with fracturing and dynamics and simulations and soft body. So I know Cineversity, after a couple weeks, uh, they put these up online. So make sure to check out that uh, first piece. But today, we are going to do the sci-fi scene and the thriller scene. So let's just take a look at the sci-fi scene right now. All right. So just to take a little closer look, we had the tune in information in the beginning. Uh, we're going to concentrate on the resolve for this part of it. We have a lot of things going on here. We have some articulated arms. We have a lot of nice uh, uh, modeling going on on here. And uh, we have these hydraulic hoses plugging this logo into the matrix. I'm not sure what it's doing, but let's go build this thing. All right. All right, we're going to start this as a fairly empty scene. So you can see I've sort of just preened out the, the back end of it, because this is all we're going to concentrate on. So one of the things I've noticed, and I'm by far not a modeler or anything, but there's a lot of tools within Cinema that uh, helps you add additional uh, detail and stuff. Because once you start texturing and lighting it, it really uh, takes it out of the sort of just generic format, and you can make something cool about it. So in this, I have these walls here. and. Of course, the ease of use of uh, Cinema 4D here. This is just a cube that I've used a cloner to roll out and then use a symmetry object just to bounce back and forth. So just through one object, I have uh, created a little hallway here. So I'm going to take just this source out, paste it back in here. Since that scene was really big, I spaced it in place, which is fine. Just press H, and that's going to frame that up. So right now, this is a parametric object. It's still live. We actually want to make this a editable object. So I'm going to press C. And now we can uh, select the faces and, and things and ch make changes to it. So I'm going to just pop in. I know this is facing right. So I'm going to look at the right. So here we are. And there's a, a lot of great knife tools in Cinema 4D that we can utilize. So I'm going to press a hotkey, which is M. I always think I want to make something, so M. And then I'm going to do some loop paths, which L makes sense for loop. All right, so once I come in here, if I drag across the top, you can see how these lines start coming in. So I'm just going to click, and it's going to go this way, this way, this way. And look down here, too, which is great. If I click in here, this is still live. I can add the number of cuts in here, plus it adds these like little arrows where I can move them around. So we can further art direct where these things are going to go, which is really great. And then I'm going to do a few more uh, targeted ones. So I'm going to press M, and I'm going to press K, which is just a line cut. So I can just click and drag, press Escape to get rid of it. I'm sorry. Let me go all the way through this one. 
There you go. Escape to get out of it. Let's just make a few more details in here. Escape to get out of it. And escape to get out of it. You know what? I might drag this down all the way. Cool. And escape. All right, so now if we go back and look at this, we have some like nice um, geometry going on, a little bit more randomized. And like I said, I'm no modeler, but there's some really easy tools that we can use to, um, to get some additional, email, um, additional detail in this. So another hotkey, U, and um, I'm sorry, M. And then I'm going to press W, which is inner extrude. And if you see me hover over this, it's going to highlight this polygon. And if I just click on this and drag, it will proportionally bring it in and add even more detail to that. So I'm just going to hop around on these, do some extra detail. Some still over there. That's cool. I just click and drag. Let's do this little guy here. Click and drag. Let's do one more here. All right, so we got the, all these adding, so even more. And then I'm going to press MT, which is extrude, which will pull this in and out. So I just click and drag again. Let's do that one out. Let's do this one in. Let's do this one out. And then we can actually scale it just to make it even a little bit different. So you can see how quickly we can go through and add a lot of extra details. So let me just pull out a few more here. So if you can imagine, if you texture this with some um, something reflective, you know what, I might just pull this one out. Something reflective, it will catch these edges um, and add some extra detail. And if you have some lighting, that will catch the light. So if you can see here, we're getting a lot more detail on this. So if I just copy and paste this back into the original scene, so copy. V is another shortcut. I can just hop back right into the other scene. Paste, it's already in place. Drop it back into the cloner. Put the original. I like to keep things. So I'm just going to put it in there and hide it. And then if we look back into the, uh, into the camera, we've got plenty of detail on the side of these, which is great. And that only just took a few minutes. So let's focus on, let's try the floor now. Another uh, feature that we can use with the knife tool. Let's paste this. Again, it's out of place, but it doesn't matter. You just press H. Go back down. I'm going to put some lines on this so I can see what's going on. I actually don't want this much uh, geometry to it, so I'm going to just make this one by one. And so I just have this clean sheet now. And I'm going to use a merge, and I'm going to bring in a vector here that I made in uh, Illustrator. And it's sort of a, sh a shape that I wanted on the floor. Now that merged it in around the front. I'm going to use a feature that I use many, many times every time I go in here. If I go to Tools, Arrange, Transfer, and then drop where I want it and press Apply, it's just going to bring it in there instead of me trying to drag it in and figure out where it's supposed to go. So let's look at this from the top. Press Again, press H. It's going to frame everything up. Nice. And rotate it down. All right, so I got this nice little floor design. and. Um, I would have no idea how to actually model this into here. But by using the knife tool, we can almost project this shape into, uh, into this floor. So I'm going to press C to make this active. I have my different shapes here. I'm actually just going to do connect objects and delete. That will just make it one. And then I'm going to change this just to linear because I don't have any curves on that. I really don't need that extra. So one of the things we just have to make sure is not intersecting this plane at all. So there we go. Now if we go back into the top, we can go into point mode and select all these. You can see we have all these active points. So again, if I press M, and then this time, I believe it's a K, I'm going to do a line cut. If I hover over this with the command down, you can see that these points have turned pink. So if I just click on one of those points, Go over here and turn off my path. Go into my polygon mode and select some of these. I now have all these projected panels in here. So I can go in. All these are separate ones. So just with the um, inner extrude tool that I used before, MW, I'm just going to 
click and drag so I can bring that in a little bit. Actually, let's do this numerically. It's great. We can do this here. 10. And then I'm going to go on the, on the outside one. MW. I'm going to do this again. I can just press apply, and it will do the exact same amount. So that's great. So I'm just going to select these inner ones, leaving those channels out. Cool. So we just got all these. And then again, using the inner extrude, I can just grab this. And now I have all these channels inside of the floor. So for me, I would have no idea, other than using this knife, great feature in the knife tool, I would have no idea even where to start on this. So now we have this extra detail. And if we wanted to you know, sweep nerves around this path, we actually have this uh, base spline, too, that we know exactly fits within this. So let's just copy V and paste this back in here. So now we're getting lots of details going. And uh, you can see how fast that uh, happens. So another one of these things was, let's see, uh, was the arm. So we're going to see how fast we can just make an articulated arm. So I'm going to open up a base project here. This is one of the ones that I've made previously. And um, this all just comes down to, and press play. You just have this end gold null that you can move around. I've actually added some spline dynamics and, and messed it around and uh, locked it into some of these joints. So all that moves together. So let me show you how fast we can put this together. Make a new scene. I'm going to look at it from the front. Now I found with the joints, it's best to use something that has some sort of uh, roundness to it. So let's say a sphere or a cylinder. So let's just start with a sphere here. Now I'm going to make a cylinder. And then we're going to put it up over here. I'm going to blast through this as quickly as I can. So command drag that, make another one. Let's make, let's make another one, a little thinner. And you know what? On this joint, I'm going to use the cylinder. So I'll change the orientation of it. But we'll make this a little bit bigger, put it down. And if you look in the perspective how this is going to work, I'm going to bring it back down into there. So I'm just command dragging these cylinders to create these arm segments. Let's make another little thinner one down. And then let's use a sphere for the last joint. We'll bring this down. This up a little bit so we can see. And then let's just bring another cylinder down. All right, and then we'll just leave it, leave it there. OK, so now we can see we have this put together very, very quickly. Now, we got to make these editable, but we have to think about how uh, these segments. So we want this top part to be one. So I'm just going to select that top part, connect objects, and delete. And then I'm going to create this second segment, connect objects, and delete. And lastly, this one, connect objects, and delete. So now. I have three different segments. And another important thing in the, for this to work is where the anchor points are. So if we use this little crosshair here, we can imagine where we want these joints to be. So there's one. We want the second joint to be here. And then we got this one, third joint to be here. And then just to be tidy, I like to put nulls at the beginning and end of these things. So let's just say start. Now let's do another one and put these in the appropriate price. So this will be the end, and this will be the start. And then we're just going to make these children of themselves all the way down and create this hierarchy. And then using character stuff, which I never really go into, but I realize if you just do a character create IK chain, no, it doesn't look like anything really happened, but we have an IK tag on here. And then we have this new null, which is the end goal. And if we just drag that around, now we have an articulated arm, which is fantastic. And for someone that knows nothing about character rigging, this is really great that we could do something like this. And then inside the IK tag, it has a twist and everything. So you can, um, you can change all these parameters in here. So I'm just going to move this back so it's straight. I kind of like to put like a base cap on this so it has something to sit on so that sphere doesn't look so strange there. 
All right, great. So if we just pop this into a group, option G, option or old G, now we have this arm group. And again, um, where the access point is is pretty important. So I'm going to bring that up to the bottom. And let's swing this around. And it's important to put it in these groups because if you start messing around once you've established the IK chain, uh, if you ma start messing around some of uh, these points, it, it starts wigging out. So it's best just to put the, all this in a group. So now you have this articulated um, arm and this moving around. Let me just put a vibrate tag on this so we can see some stuff moving. Vibrate, let's just go 50, 50, 50. Two is probably too fast. Let's just go on one. Let me stretch out. Ooh. 30 frames a second. Everything looks better in 24. Let's do that. Go down. Just press play. All right, so we got this moving around. I might actually give it some more on the Y. So all this is still live. And since this is in a group, you can even pop it in a cloner if you want. Let's like make this radial. All right, that's kind of cool if you need something like that. I don't like that uh, plane that it's on. Oh, that's creepy. I don't like that one either. And then, oh, look at this. They have a little group going. So as you can imagine, if you did different ones of these, animated them in different ways, you keyframe them, uh, you can come up with something really interesting pretty quickly. So let me just copy and paste this back into the other project. And then uh, again, I am going to use the transfer because it's in the wrong place. Range objects, transfer, and then let's find this floor. This floor is here. OK. And I remember from going through this, <laughs> it's, uh, it's on the bottom. There it is. OK. All right, so even quickly, we've added so much detail to this, to this scene. We got the walls. We got the floor. And then we got these arms now. Now for the final piece, let's concentrate on uh, where the hoses are. So let's go on that. So this is actually a, a just made from a spline. So let me grab this. I've uh, made it uh, editable, but I do have the source spline here. So let me copy these into a new project so you can see what's going on. All right, so here's our logo. Here's our spline back here. I'm going to turn this off real quick. So we want all these hoses to go into the back of this. And there was a couple different ways to do it. But uh, with the help of the uh, great people here at uh, Maxon, they've shown me uh, the easiest way to do this. So I'm just going to pop this into an extrude object. And we can't see anything, but that's OK, because we have this hierarchical checkbox. And now we see it. OK, so we're going to bring this back. So now, if I go onto the lines, we can see how, how these hoses are going to be. But still, it doesn't look very natural or anything like that. And I fear having this much geometry, it's just going to bog everything down. So I'm going to go into these, um, into these splines. I'm just going to go to none. So now. There isn't much going on here. So I'm going to turn off this front one. And actually, I don't even need the caps. So let me take the caps off. And now I'm going to have these lines here. So if I make this an actual object, I can pull the lines out. So now we have this. And if I go into line mode, you can see that I can select these. Now let me just do select all. and that's. That's good. I still fear that there might be too much, and we still have these caps. And I've noticed a lot of times it's easier to deselect things than select things. So I'm just going to press U to select something. And then L, of course, makes sense, loop. And then I'm going to hold the command to get rid of them into trying to select all the uh, front ones. So here we go. And I still feel like there's too many, so I'm going to I'm going to get rid of some more. Actually, I'm going to get out of the loop, selecting too many. I won't bore you folks with this too much. And this is really just for performance issues, so we can get through this presentation as fast as possible. All right, so now we have these lines selected. And I'm going to use a little, well, maybe a little known tool. But once I discovered that it existed, I use it quite a lot. So as long as these are selected, and then you have your object selected, if you go to Mesh and then Command, there's an edge to spline. So now we can use that selection. And if we choose this, we're going to have, it's going to extract and create a spline 
of that selection, which is fantastic. So now we have the shape that we want. And if we go into point mode, we can start messing with this. So I know that I want the back to flare out. So I'm going to grab this. And then I'm going to scale this up a little bit. And actually, I might rotate this as well. So it looks like it's hanging down from the ceiling. So by just using that, you can see how we have this base shape already. So we're, we're already halfway there, which is great. So one of the things we're going to use with this is the spline dynamics. And we're in, uh, I found that linear works the best with this, but we're going to have to add some more points, which is easy enough to do. So I'm just going to use the um, subdivide. If I right click on this, go down to subdivide, you can see that it started adding uh, points to this. And I know, too, if I press U and then S, makes sense for subdivide. We can do this. So U, S, that should be enough for this. OK, so now we have this. Let me put back on the logo so we can see how that's going to come out. So let me, under uh, the hair tags, we have spline dynamics. So I'm just going to attach that to it. Let's press play and see what happens. All right, well, we got dynamics. It's not exactly what we want, but it's a start for sure. So let me get rid of this. We want to be able to uh, keep the front and the top in place so nothing moves. So we can do this in a couple different ways. I'm going to select this, go to point mode, and I'm just going to select this front face right here. So all these points, I want to say, stay in the same place. So under this tag, there's actually a fixed one. So if I press set, it's going to say, OK, you points, you stay in the same place, and the rest are going to fall down. So great, we're going in the right direction here. So I'm going to do something else for these, um, for these top ones. I'm going to lasso these top, because I want these top ones to be able to move. If you do fixed, you're not going to be able to move any of these. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to establish uh, something where you can uh, move it. I'm just going to use a null. You can actually use any. Um, any object. Again, look, look here, we're using transfer because the null's in a different place. Transfer to this spline. Boom, it's right there. You don't have to think about anything. So if we go back into point mode for this, I have that top selected, I believe. It looks like everything's selected. And then again, under the hair, hair tags, there's this constraint. So if we say this, whatever's selected here, I can drop in this and say, stick to this no matter what. So if I press set, and if I press play again, you'll see that it, these two are both in place. And let me just change the settings on this again and add some more frames so we can see what's going on. So we got this. And then now we have this null that we can actually move around and control it. So if you want to make these lines look super crazy, we can animate that. So actually, I'm going to do some less drag on this and some less stiffness so it's a little bit bouncier. Now, if we go back, I can actually put a vibrate tag on this guy again. And let's just do maybe not so much. Let's just do 50-50 and maybe ro some rotation on it, too. Oh, I got to do enable. And not too fast either. So we have all these great tools that will help all these move without actually having to do keyframes. And since these are splines, we can use the uh, sweep nerve, which I use all the time, which is going to take a shape and then roll it down these spline shapes. So now I'm going to just put on this circle. Always remember the shape that you want goes in uh, first on the hierarchy, and then I can just drop this in here. Obviously, the circle is way too big. Let's just bring it down to, say, 8. Let me turn off these lines so we can see it a little bit better. And now we have some geometry to, um, here, I'm going to bring, bring this up again. Have some geometry to these lines. And again, too, since this is a live spline, if we want to do put anything on those splines, we can do that as well. Let's just do a sphere. I know that's going to be super big. But if we make this an object mode and then drop the spline in here, now we can put things on this. Let's bring it down just for performance. And then we can animate the rotation. So we got the feedback going into the matrix. And um, that's pretty cool that we can do that. So let me just drop that into the master project. 
We just need these things, group them. Option G, copy V back into sci-fi. Make sure to go back to the front so the dynamics doesn't freak out. Let's go back into the camera. Great, I'm gonna press play. And here we go, so now we have all this detail. We have live dynamics, we have an IK chain arm, an articulated arm that we can move around. So you can see in just a matter of 15 minutes or so, 20 minutes, we can start building out these, uh, these uh, scenes really quickly. So we got all that, so let's check out another scene here. Let's move on to the next one. So the next one is, let's just call this one a thriller scene. So let's watch this. Again, tune in at the beginning, go through. We got a nice little creepy scene at the end. And I just want to say thanks to my friend Mike at Audio Brewery for doing that sound design. It's really great for all of these. So we'll just take a closer look at this. We have uh, just a populated forest. We have a art-directed hill of where this is. And we have a nice little car going down here, low res as it may be. So let's jump into this scene really quick and see how we can do it. So I wanted to keep the uh, where this hill was dynamic and procedural. So I use something called a displacement uh, deformer, which is, comes in this menu. There's a lot of powerful deformers in here that do a lot of great things, especially when you layer them together. And it's great that you can go back in and change them. You haven't committed to anything. So I've made that a child of, here's my um, plane here. And with this, how it works is it uses uh, a shader to deform the ge uh, geometry here. So I'm just gonna, so we can see, I'm gonna add a noise here, and you can see that it's already had a pretty big effect. Noise in Cinema 4D is amazing. You can animate it. And uh, this all works on a luminous value, so uh, black is as far down as it goes, and white is as far up as it goes. So if I change this white to a gray, you'll see that it comes down. And the fact that you can animate these things too, it works really well. But in this case, I used gradients to sort of shape this. So if you look in here, this is not quite white, but is brighter on this. So this is going to start high, and then it's going to taper down. I also use gradients because it has this nice turbulence uh, setting in here. So let me turn this on. And you can see immediately that it's gone up. So if I go back into here, change these parameters around a bit, I can say where that's going to be. And I haven't uh, committed to anything. So I just started layering these gradients. I wanted it to come up on the top over on this corner, but that's made a problem of here. We don't want to see the front, but that's cool. We'll just lay another gradient over the top that's dark at the front, and we've put it down. So now we've sculpted this nice geography here. And if we just put another plane in, and we got some water, and there we go. We got a nice little mountain scene going. So the next step to this would be to add some trees to it. I have a pretty low poly tree just to move things along uh, quickly on this. But I'm going to use a cloner. And I'm actually going to turn the cloner off, and I'll tell you why in a second. Dra drag this tree in. I'm going to make this an object mode. And I'm going to put our ground in there. Now, I've turned it off because by default, it will, it's set to the uh, vertex distribution. So it's going to want to put a uh, tree on every single one of these vertex, and it will just bog down the system. So if you're going to do something with a lot of um, geometry to your mesh, then make sure to turn that off first. I'm going to change this to surface, and it's going to be much more mellow. So you have to turn it on. Usually, if it's off on an axis, if you uh, unclick a line clone, it will fix that right up. So now I'm also going to do render instances. If your clone is not moving or not deforming, you can uh, check this, and it will help with the performance. So let's just go up to 200. All right, that's pretty good. Let's go to 2,000. All right, so that's populated that pretty good, but we got a problem. It's in this lake now. And how are we going to uh, change that? So there's a great way to do this procedurally where we can uh, just brush on and brush off and change things on the fly. So I'm going to look at this from the top. And since this is a cloner, we can go back into the MoGraph. And here we have the MoGraph selection. So as long as I have that selected, MoGraph selection, if you see I got this little circle here, that's my brush. So I'm going to make that a little bit bigger. So this will be uh, go faster. And I'm just going to start brushing on here. Obviously, we don't need it under this mountain. 
I'm going to go around and I'm just going to shape this a little bit for the, uh, for the lake to exist in. Okay. So it's just a matter of brushing this on. You could do this in the um, perspective view, too, if you needed to. If that helped, I just found because I could shape things a little bit better this way. All right. So now, if you see, I have a little tag up here. So all that is established, and it's just a matter of going back up to hide selected, click off, boom, they're all gone, which is really, really impressive that you could do. And even better, if I just go into a different uh, view here, if there's something that I do or don't like, for instance, if I think that clone is too, too close, if I go back to my cloner, click on this again, go back to my selection, if I hold shift, I can just start painting off things. If I hold command, I can paint things back on. So I can have a lot of feedback of what, what I, uh, how I want to shape this. So let's just go back to the scene view here. All right, so we have this pretty well populated. I find these just to be a little too big, so let me uh, go through this and change it. Again, procedural, we can just go in and change this. We haven't committed to anything. Now, I want to put a nice little road that sort of runs down this uh, water line. So let me go back up to the top view here. I'm just going to draw a spline in here and um, go to the pen tool. I love B splines. With this particular one, I'm going to use a bezier so I can make you know tighter curves, turns here. So I'm just going to loosely draw out a road going on here. Press escape to get out of that. All right, cool. We got this spline here, but somehow we got to deform this to the geometry of this. And uh, there was a couple of ways that I tried to do this. I'm going to get it close into here and um, select some points, but then we got the handles, and sometimes that gets a little bit weird. So I was thinking there's got to be some way to be able to do this. So I went, I realized on mesh, I saw a spline menu here, and that's one of the great things about Cinema 4D. They have so many menus and go so deep that if you're trying to figure out how to do something, you just start looking at some menus, and you can uh, usually find something that may apply. And uh, second to that, if you right-click on some of these things, they have the best help of any program that I've used with. Examples, what the parameters actually mean is really useful, so you can dive in that and teach yourself. But I found this little thing here called Project, and I was like, hey, that might work. So I clicked on that, and I said, ooh, mode, there's plane. That's X, that's Z. I wonder if that's, that'll work. Press Apply. And now, if I go back and look at it, that's actually gone into that deformation, which is amazing, because that would take forever to use the, um, I'm going to bring it up a little bit, to use the uh, handles to figure that out. And if I had more points in this, it would deform it properly all the way through. But again, just presentation purposes to get through this quickly. Um, I have this with less geometry. All right, so now we got this path. And let's just make a road really quickly. So I'm going to use something called a uh, spline wrap for this. I'm just going to add a cube. And it's all the way back in the scene. That doesn't matter. Because when I add, if we go into the uh, deformers, here's a spline wrap. Make that a child of this cube. And then tell this spline wrap, hey, this is the road. I want you to put it on it. All right, so there it is. Obviously, <laughs> that doesn't work very well, but that's only because I haven't added any geometry to this. So if I start adding some segments, let's just go straight up to 72. Now we got a road. Obviously, that's way too tall and too big. So let me just bring this back. All right, that's looking pretty good, but it almost looks like a racetrack with it banked, and that's also simple enough to change. So if I just change, make a duplicate of this spline, I'm going to call this a rail, and I'm going to bring this up a little bit. I can tell this spline wrap, hey, this spline here is up. Always point towards this. So I'm going to drop this into the rail, and you can see now that it's all flattened. So that's really amazing. And we got trees in here, but that doesn't matter because, again, we can just go back into this, go back to the MoGraph selection, make sure you got shift, and we can just paint all these things out because we're going to put a, a little car on here. So now, I wonder if we, what could we could do if we had a car. So we got, I have a little pre-made super low poly car. And if we just use the uh, align to spline, 
Again, the, we're all sourcing off of this base spline. You can see that I got my little car here. We can do tangential, so it, it follows the path. Let's start a little further, further along here. Let's say 35. OK, we're in the trees. And I'm just going to set a keyframe that's option or alt, or you can right click on that. And then I'm going to set another one. And then I'm actually going to, I'm going to go up to the uh, timeline real quick. I want these to be linear. So those are selected. I'm just going to make those. So it's a constant pace this whole time. All right, so we got this little car going. Oh, did I not animate that? I did not animate that, silly me. Okay, let's say 80, all right, too far. Okay, so now we got the little car moving here. So not only did we create this forest, we created a road that goes along it, and now we can put a little car that goes along. And just for some fun, let's put a camera in. Let's make that the camera. Target, I'm gonna say look at this little guy. Sorry, not the cube, the car. And now we can follow this little car as it goes along. So you can see how powerful, whoops, I'm behind the uh, mountain there. You can see how powerful this is. In under 10 minutes, we've built out this, and uh, we can do some really cool stuff. All right, so that are the two scenes there. I just want to hop in really quickly, you know, how this uh, versioning works. So I just want to touch quickly about how we use Cinema 4D as a hub. Um, the creative sphere is just getting bigger and bigger. People use different things. Uh, people have different tal talents. If your team is really big, some people may have uh, specializations. And Cinema 4D is great for that uh, import uh, and export and the interchange between all those things. Um, I was originally an After Effects artist, and once the um, workflow between After Effects and Cinema 4D, uh, it really goes hand in hand. And once that started happening, that's when I got into Cinema 4D, and I use them uh, all the time together and great import out export formats. We, uh, some of the artists use Houdini. We export an Olympic sequence. We do stuff in Houdini, bring it back as an Olympic, and then we're back into cinema where we can touch our uh, output with um, other elements that other artists might have done. Um, the physical renderer, the pro renderer is great, and there's also third-party renderers available. So I'm just going to jump into this versioning really quick. So if you remember at the head of these, we have the tune-in information. We have this little scene here, and it says tomorrow. And we know that we're going to have to change this to countless versions next week, tonight, uh, this Christmas. You know, Anything that you can think of, we're going to have to change. So if we think about it, really, there's going to be more. And there's going to be more and more and more. So the thing that we have to figure out is we got to extract this type out. And then we got to extract the only other thing that uh, the type is generating is this uh, reflection. So if we can take that out and render an empty scene and put that type back in, we're golden. All right. So now let me jump into uh, our versioning here. And I got to get through this super quick. So forgive me if I go really fast. All right, so here's our scene, and we got our type. It's live type, so as we start versioning things out, we can just change these, and we have effectors uh, controlling those animations, and I actually have an effector linked to the camera, so as the camera gets close, it activates further movement. Um, so we have this scene. We know we want the type, so uh, we're going to do an empty scene. We're going to render all this out have this totally clean, and extract the type and the floor out into a different scene. And um, I also have other elements in here. One of the important things, since I'm going to comp this in After Effects, is to have uh, 3D position data. And by adding these external compositing tags and uh, on your output down here, compositing project file, once you have those tags on, you can just save a project file out. Actually, let's just do one really quick. And that's going to save out a file um, that has the 3D data information on it. So I've told where this null is, After Effects will know where that is. So that's how we do that. We're just going to render that scene out. So let me just open up the type only scene. All right, so we have the type, and we just have the floor. So we know we're going to get a reflection out of it. We don't even re really need the floor. We just need the reflection pass from it. And then we have the type as well. I'm going to click and drag this. I'm going to make a new one here. 
turn this guy off. And you can see tonight we're in here. And great with cinema, you can uh, change the kerning, which is really, really important, I feel. Let's just make another one here, too. And let's call this what I have there, Tuesday. So let's just do that again. Turn that guy. All right, so what I want, I'm going to take off these two. Tomorrow will be my main one. And you can use the power of takes to make this really easy to be able to version all these out and output them all at once so you don't have to worry about doing multiple projects and stuff. I'm just going to drag this over here so you can see. So, oops. So under tasks, I'm just going to uh, establish a new uh, subtake of this. And so I know the top one is tomorrow. Next one's tonight. And I'm going to press this. If you notice, it's a record button. So I'm going to go into tonight. And then I'm going to tell it to be tonight. OK? And then I'm going to go back to turn off the record. I'm going to make a new take. And what was it? I think it was Tuesday. OK. Put record on. I'm going to go back into this. It defaults back to the original one. And then we got Tuesday here. OK, so now we have three takes. Make sure to take it off. We have tomorrow, tonight, and Tuesday. So you, you can imagine how you can set all that up and output it all at once and not have to do multiple um, projects to make that happen. And then the other thing to it, which is great, because we have a lot of different output um, formats, that if we use this um, render setting here, I have other render presets. So let's say Tuesday, we need it square to go on Facebook. And then for tonight, we need it. Uh, if I change it to tonight, um, we have a different format for here. If I just go to display, I'll have to configure. Oh, it's not showing up. So this would be a 16 nine, or a 916 the other way around. So not only can you do different versions, but you can do different output formats as well. And then one further thing, if I can jam through this really quick, um, we can use takes to create own directories as well. So not only do you have to set up all those things, so depending on your Mac or PC, forward slash, backslash, and then you can use this pull down here, and you can say current take name. So this will be tomorrow. It will make a new folder called tomorrow. Just do another slash, and then you can do that again. So it will name the file tomorrow underscore and then current frame. So then it will give you the frame. And then when you render that out at once, it will create all the directories, and it will create all the different names. So um, let me just jump into After Effects really quick. And I can show you how all this stuff comes together. That's just fine. All right, so here's our empty scene. And then if you look at our uh, type render, so we got our type, which is just the floor. And then we have this mat so we can extract the type. And then we have the reflection. So that's just a matter of laying this right on top of our empty scene. And as quick as that, we have this versioned out. Now, we have that 3D information that we need as well, because we want to put something in front of this. So if we saw that uh, AEC file that we exported out, I'm going to bring that in. All right. I actually have this hidden from before, so I'm going <laughs> to use this. And we're going to keep on going. So I have this on placement, which is a null. So it brings in the camera, and we have a null position. And I have this little pre-comp here for on. And I'm going to tell that to go into here. So I'm going to drag this in real quick. And then I got a position keyframe. I can just straight position keyframe in this. I got to make this a 3D object. Paste this in. Oh, we're on 0, 0 coordinates. OK, so now you can see that this is in space. The coordinates are being a little bit weird. Um, but we can replace things out. But let me just show how easy it is to version these things out tonight. OK, so if we, I have an additional alternate here, type alt tonight. So that's just a matter of option dragging. Make sure the mat is option dragged. And then change the floor here. So now we have a completely new scene that you can put together in 
under 10 seconds. So you can see how that would be valuable to version out over and over and over again. So, um, and once you have that 3D position data as well, if you don't want any of this type in here, you can put some pre-comps in here, make a fake reflection, switch out logos, um, because there's always lots of different formats that we're going to need to put into this. And now that we have this base project, it's all very variable and uh, interchangeable about what we can put in that. So you can see how that would be a powerful thing. So with that, in conclusion, Thank you very much for listening. I hope I had some valuable uh, tricks to uh, help your workday <laughs> be a lot easier. And uh, I just want to uh, thank Fox for letting me be here and my, all my cool colleagues. I want to thank Maxon for having me back. And I want to thank you guys for listening to me. So thank you very much. Mm -hmm.